Welcome everybody to the ABT Time Podcast. And this is going to be the 50th episode of the podcast in which we were warned that most podcasts don't make it past 20 episodes. We've now landed on number 50 and we're going to do something special today with a special guest and a special guest interviewer. But before we get to that, let me give you a little update on what's going on in the land of ABT. We are now in the 34th round of the ABT framework course. This one's going with the U.S. Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We've got rounds 35, 36, 37 all lined up. It's going to be a busy summer. But we're here to do the 50th episode. And the first thing to tell you about is that we've got a special guest interviewer who is going to ask five very well thought out and worked out questions that I've worked on with him because the special guest interviewer is my older brother, Eric. Uh, Eric Olson, who is a retired lawyer in the state of Montana and worked for many years there running the public defenders training program. He also spent 14 years in Alaska working as a lawyer there on Native American rights issues and I think fishing issues and things of that sort. So he brings quite a bit of knowledge of those types of issues too. The questions he'll be asking as well as you've got a great background in history um to get going here and very relevant to all the discussions we're having i'm going to draw on uh, chat gpt for two elements of setup and we've been talking a lot about chat gpt and i'm going to show you right now how powerful of a resource it is believe it or not so the first thing i'm going to involve it with is giving a proper introduction to our main guest Dr. Patricia Limerick, and I'm kind of uh, legendary for doing a horrible job with introductions, but that maybe will change forever now, thanks to ChatGPT, who has written out this introduction. So here's what I did. I put into, you know, it's all about prompting with ChatGPT. I asked it, uh, write an introduction to the ABT Time podcast for my guest, Dr. Patricia Limerick of the University of Colorado. Here's what it wrote for me. Welcome to the ABT Time Podcast, where we explore the fascinating world of science, technology, and culture through the lens of the ABT framework, and but therefore. I'm thrilled to have as our guest today, Dr. Patricia Limerick, a renowned historian and professor of environmental studies at the University of Colorado. Dr. Limerick is the author of numerous books, including The Legacy of Conquest, The Unbroken Past of the American West, and A Ditch in Time, The City, the West, and Water. Her work focuses on the intersection of history, culture, and the environment, with a particular emphasis on the American West. In this episode, we'll be discussing how the ABT framework can be applied to the study of history and the environment, and how it can help us better understand complex issues such as climate change and conservation. We'll also be exploring Dr. Limerick's own experiences with the ABT framework and how it has influenced her approach to teaching and research. So sit back, relax, enjoy us, and, and join us for an enlightening conversation with Dr. Patricia Limerick on the ABT Time podcast. Okay, that's pretty amazing thing that it wrote all in one second. Um, the one giant omission it seems like it made was it made no mention of her being a MacArthur Fellow, which is an enormous credential. Uh, also didn't mention her Mellon Foundation grant, uh, other bits and pieces like that. And threw in things that we aren't going to do in the podcast. It was just assuming we'd be talking about climate and the environment, not so much. This is just going to be history. It's, it's mostly going to be a discussion of her landmark book from 1987, The Legacy of Conquest, which it did mention. And that's the whole deal. Why we're doing this is that uh, Eric read her book a, a couple months ago and began ra raving to me. He read the 2000 edition of it that had a, a prelude to the second edition that she'd written, a really nice update that he liked a lot. And as he raved to me, I said, you know what, why don't we just make this into an episode of the podcast and have you ask questions of Patty? So that's the origin of all this. Now, this little intro I'm presenting right now is being put together after we've already recorded the, the discussion two days ago. And I listened to it yesterday. And one thing that kind of hit me was we got an issue to address here, which is both of them are um, older uh, professionals. They're in their 70s. And both of them um, referred to use the word Indian and Indian affairs and Indian history and Indian Indian did not use the term Native American. And I think a lot of young people are basically trained these days to use Native American. So I talked to Eric yesterday about what should I do to address this? Because it really needs to be talked about here to set up this whole episode. He began giving me you know, some ideas and I was making notes of them. 
and then all of a sudden it just dawned on me, wait a second, why don't I just feed this into chat GPT, which is what everybody's going to start doing now. You know, this is going to become second nature for everybody, just like you Google things. It's now going to become, wait a second, instead of agonizing over writing this thing over the next few days, let's just type it into GPT and get a whole draft in one second. That's what I did. So here's what I typed in. Write an explanation for why experts being interviewed about American history use the term Indians instead of Native Americans. Here's what it said. The use of the term Indians to refer to Native Americans is a complex issue that has evolved over time. Historically, the term Indian was used by European explorers who mistakenly believed they had landed in India. This term was then used to describe the indigenous people they encountered in the Americas. Over time, many Native Americans have expressed their preference for being referred to as Native Americans rather than Indians, as they feel the latter term is inaccurate and disrespectful. However, the term Indian is still used by some experts and scholars, particularly those who have been in the field for a long time, meaning our two folks here today. One reason for this may be that the term Indian has been used for centuries and many experts are simply accustomed to using it. And additionally, some scholars argue that the term Native American is not completely accurate either, as it implies that all indigenous peoples in the Americas share a single culture and identity, which is not the case. That's where this stuff's just, the more you split it, the more complicated it becomes to the point where you can't communicate about anything. Side note, okay. Getting back to what was said here. Moreover, there are many different tribes and nations within the larger category of Native American, each with its own distinct history and culture. Therefore, some experts argue that using the term Indian can be more inclusive. There's an important word more inclusive and encompassing way of referring to the various indigenous peoples of the Americas. Ultimately, the choice of whether to use the term Indian or Native American is a personal and cultural one, and it's important to respect the preferences of those being referred to. When interviewing experts about American history, it is advisable to ask them which term they prefer to use and to respect their choice. I did not think to ask either the two of our guests which term they were going to use. They just used it. And you'll see, they went with Indians. And at one point, you'll even hear Eric say that, you know, that's what I was taught in law school was Indian law. So uh, there you have it. So on that note, let's start the show. And I will hand it over to our special guest interviewer, interviewer um, Eric, to get the ball rolling. So take it away, Eric. Let me begin with uh, what I thought was I, I, I made notes, both mental and uh, and physical, as I went through the book long before anybody suggested that we might have a question and answer session here. But I did come up with uh, some questions. And what I'll do is basically try to articulate the background to the topic and then ask you the question and give you the opportunity to sort of uh, inform me and the listeners about your point of views and your uh, your uh, 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 options as a uh, as a historical writer. Uh, let me start by talking about the notion of revisionism and accuracy, and the question of whether accuracy matters to a historian. I think it was Napoleon who's reputed to have said that history is a fable agreed upon. Um, that's a corollary in my mind to the. Uh, famous adage, which is often attributed to Churchill and was ominously repeated by Hermann Goering, uh, the Nazi commander in chief at the Nuremberg trials, that history is written by the victors. Writing in the 18th century about historical storytelling, a Frenchman Bernard Fontenelle commented as follows. Here's a quote that I found in, uh, in doing a little research on the whole notion of, uh, of revisionism and imagination. And here's the quote. He writes, it's actually harder to adhere strictly to the truth than to embellish a tale, especially when it's about something exciting. It's harder because, number one, our imagination gets heated up with its subject and begins to elaborate the tale all on its own. And number two, the more marvelous details you add, the more interest, encouragement, and admiration you arouse in your audience. And then Fontenelle says, but though rationality is hard to achieve and the imagination is lively, it's still essential that we historical writers and readers, I suppose, too, resist ignorance. So here's my question. As a historian, a writer of history, 
How can you be sure that you're relating objective facts rather than subjective interpretations or stories? Well, thank you. And that is a, a core question that my, my people, if I can refer to historians that way, have had to wrestle with. I am going to say that it's actually pretty easy to cope with this if we didn't drive ourselves so crazy and making it harder. If that, if that it's about to make sense, I think it'll be about to make sense. So of course we can't possibly put together a full comprehensive 100% accurate stand for the ages version of the past. We can't put together a full stand for the ages. Everything is comprehensive. Everything is known now. We can't do that for the last minute of our lives. I mean, it's just, we live, we're human beings. It's really complicated. It's always really complicated. And so we are always approximating. We're always uh, giving it our, well, not everyone is always giving it their best shot, but we, the best we can do is to give it our best shot and to be very honest and very humble in saying this may, it, well, this is certain to fall short of a 100% accurate transcription of something that happened in the past that we weren't present for. So a little bit of humility goes, not a little bit, a lot. I mean, I would say in many ways, historians should be the leaders in helping our poor society recapture the virtue of humility because we're always defeated. The people of the past are always hiding from us. They just, sometimes they lie to the people of the future. Sometimes they just don't understand themselves. Sometimes their courthouses burn down and we lose records and so on. So we never get to say, got it. Something that's just popped into my mind as you were saying that that's really fascinating ABT stuff is that we kind of base our whole body of the knowledge of the ABT around the, the quotes from Frank Danielle way back in the beginning who talked about um, we always fall into the dreaded and then and then and then structure when we write first drafts. It's in the revisions that we remove the and thens and replace them with buts and therefores. That's kind of like the the urtext for the whole ABT. Um, when you think about that, that you see there's a bit of a parallel there between what we're talking about, the the risk that history doesn't fall into tight stories so much and be, has to begin with and then and then and that we might reshape it whether we want to or not over time into more ABT. But that's more for down the road we'll get into. So uh, great. OK, so that's a good start. Um, Eric, you want to take it away with question number two? When a historical writer undertakes to produce a, a new or quote unquote revised treatment of history, is it important to incorporate points of view such as those expressed by Shakespeare or by Napoleon into the final count as well as the truth? Uh, there's a complete obligation not to drive your readers to distraction by trying to cover everything. And so there's necessarily some very intense processes of choice and selection. And some of that involves how much do you incorporate of what your uh, predecessors have said. So yes, his history, the writing of history is an ongoing conversation between people over the ages. And I'm in some relationship, I'm honored to be in some relationship to the Greek historian Herodotus from, well, long time ago. So good, we're all together. But many people have noted that if we go back to the real origins of the writing, the attempt to write about human history, we'll never be seen again. I love Herodotus. I'm not so fond of Thucydides, but I have never really brought them into my uh, historiographic review. And that very word is part of the problem. The word historia historiographic or historiography, nobody's pulse races at that. Nobody says, oh, I'm so excited. I'm reading this book by an historian. And the first 150 pages are about references to the historians that came before she wrote. So whew, that is, that's, uh, that is not kind or merciful to your fellow human beings. So, so in some ways you carry all of those predecessors around in your, your own mind and you are in a sometimes fevered conversation with them. And you are saying, you guys, you didn't have a clue and you pretended to know what you were talking about for heaven's sake. So you're often in that relationship with your uh, elders and predecessors, but it's pretty boring. And so you can do a little bit of that, of saying those who wrote on the subject before me, well, in my case, those who wrote on Western American history before me, a good share of them simply saw Indian people as not there or as only temporarily there. Maybe there for a battle or war or uh, removal to a reservation, but then that was that. Well, that is not accurate. That is not the least bit of an accurate story of the role of Indian people in the American West. So I don't think there's much to be gained from my 
really going back over the uh, blindness or blind spots, I guess I'll call it that, of my predecessors. But there's every reason for me to sort of talk it through with them. These are often historians who are no longer alive, but they can wake you in the night, yammering at you, these people whose works you read when you were in graduate school. So you have to take it up with them. But I don't know that you're doing any kindness to your readers if you say, this, this is the context. I did some of that in Legacy of Conquest, but I really tried to be merciful and just write about as much as I could the people of the past and not so much about the people in the, in the uh, jury box or in the gallery looking at the people of the past. I didn't think of, historians, I love historians. I go to conventions with them, I'm chatted with them. I don't really expect readers to, in, to join me in that. The readers deserve to go as, as directly as I can to this, these are the people who lived before us in the West. And this is my best shot at, at conveying their stories. Okay, and then so connecting right to that, and and you're forced to go with a certain amount of simplicity. Let's let's move to the second topic, which is stereotyping. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And and that was a good lead in because I did want to ask a, a question about stereotyping, and I'll give you a little predicate to it based on some other things that uh, that I, I'm sure you you incorporated into your study of history over the years. Webster defines stereotype as a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular person or thing. That definition is accurate for, from our working point of view, but it doesn't necessarily eliminate the notion that sometimes stereotypes can be correct. We, you know, we, we often consider stereotype as a dirty word, you know, you're oversimplifying or whatever, but oftentimes there are elements included in a stereotype that are quite accurate. Um, a common example, and this is a, a sort of a, in the heart of your book, a, a common stereotype of Indians in historical writing, so-called Indians, uh, was that they were not only savage, but they were unproductive and uh, uncultured and uneducable. Um, J John Sedwick, Sedgwick wrote a book called Blood Moon. It's a history of the Cherokee people. Uh, that's, a, that's a story that I, not his book, but the story of the Cherokee uh, people and the removal is one that I've been interested in pretty much my whole life. And certainly when I went to law school and studied uh, uh, what used to be called Indian law. Um, and in his book, he discusses that uh, it was the stereotype of the red man that provided much of the impetus and support for the infamous removal of the indigenous people of the Southeast in the 1820s and culminating in the 30s. Uh, but in fact, he also points out that the truth of the matter was that recognize, recognizing that they were in a, a, a dilemma as a result of the conquest of their homelands, the Cherokee did everything they could to try to disabuse the American government of the stereotype and the fallacy of the stereotype. For instance, they built, and you, and you talk about a lot of this in your book, they built and lived in Western type houses. They set up their own schools. They adopted the Western style of dress. This is all in the early part of the 19th century. They produced an alphabet to facilitate their ability to, uh, to explain themselves and to communicate. Uh, uh, to the white man and to the other cultures that they interacted with. They drafted a constitution, which they drew upon the American constitution for, and they even owned slaves, which is something that a lot of people were not aware of. Um, let me ask you this then, uh, uh, as a historian, and especially when approaching uh, history from a new direction, as you did, I, I believe, in the legacy of conquest, how do you treat stereotypes in your historical construction? Well, I have certainly learned um, a lot since I wrote Legacy of Conquest. And one of the things I learned is that if you, if you go before a public audience and you basically say, boy, you people have sure got it wrong. My Lord, it's lucky that I'm here because you have been going around thinking about Western history and Indian people and, and um, Mexican people and so on. And you are just really, really wrong. And the stereotypes you have fallen for, oh, Lord, horrible. So, I, I never really did that, the terrible parody I just did there. I never did that, but I did see myself on a mission of correcting misapprehensions, debunking mistaken ideas and so on. And I did that and that had some impact, but you were 
boy, are you at risk of preaching to the choir and converting and persuading nobody when you take that stance. So it's a lot better to take other strategies. And one other strategy is simply to, to put forward the story, the sort of thing that you just did. Um, I used, I remember when I first read Paul Radin, I think did a bunch of interviews with uh, Midwestern Indian people. And he had one little story where, where a fellow, um, can't remember which tribe, but one of the, the Great Lakes tribes, he, he took a train on a raid to go kill an enemy. And as a young idiot, I thought, what? Conduct a traditional, this is what we do, customary raid, and to get on a train to do it? Whoever heard of such a thing? That is such a, well, that was me being a young idiot, because people can c carry on traditions and can use modern technology, and that's the same person, and it doesn't say, well, this is hypocrisy, or this is inconsistent. It's paradox, is that people remain the same and, and change. And that is true for all of us, and it's true for Indian people. So I think I do better. I certainly got better when I didn't try to tell people that they had been wrong. Which is not, which is really not, we have a lot of that going on. A lot of people seem to think today in 2023 that that's the way to get to people is tell them how wrong they are. Uh, not so good. Just better to invite them to consider some stories that raise other uh, possibilities and inclinations. And good heavens, Indian people's history is so full of the stories that just make you pause and say, well, that's not what I expected. Well, I should take that in and I should be maybe a little more cautious in what I go around thinking I know. Maybe I should do that. So there's many ways to do it besides the debunking. Boy, have you ever got a mind stuff with stereotypes as to whether some I guess some stereotypes, well, I mean, I suppose they all come from something, what was an initial impression, and it might have been a mistaken or a seen from the corner of the eye impression. But the part that where I feel sympathetic in ways that maybe I shouldn't, maybe a better, more pure-minded person could be different on this, but I think the world is so enormously complicated that we try to steer through it in any way we can. And one of the things that we have to do, because there are so many people and they're all around us and we run into them and we have to keep saying, is this a person I should be frightened of? Is this a person I should seek to have as my best friend? You're just making these judgments all the time. And there's nothing, there's nothing to be done about it except to do your best and sometimes accept the fact that you are going to say, I don't like that person. And you, you don't know that person. You have no reason to say that. So you have to sort them out. You have to figure out, am I with somebody, am I reading about a historical figure that I find sympathetic? Am I reading about a historical figure that I find abhorrent? Well, by all means, take in the data and, and at first sort it into simple categories, admirable, abhorrent. Then if you have anything like a normal situation, you will find that the same person is, is admirable and abhorrent. And then you have to you have to stretch your cognitive frameworks to say, oh, that didn't work when I tried to simplify. So I think there's nothing that is we certainly couldn't prohibit if we try. People will always start with simple-minded stereotyping notions, almost always. People will say, oh, that's the kind of historical figure I've always really thought the world of. Or that's the kind of historical figure who set us down the path of calamity that we're still on. So very tempting to do that. It's not the worst place to start. In fact, I'm gonna say it's a pretty good place to start because it takes the person from the past seriously. It says, you either did something that we are still treasuring or ought to treasure, or you did something so dreadful that we should be uh, rejecting it in every way. But you're saying to, to this person, this dead person, totally dead person from the past, you're saying you mattered and you still matter. And that is storytelling basically, yeah. um, which leads us then to our third topic. So. Uh, on to storytelling. Yeah, that, that was nice. That was nicely. That was a nice setup for this uh, storytelling, uh, uh, Patty. And you know, historical accuracy revisionism complicated by, as you pointed out, the very complex topic of stereotypes, all blends itself into what's obviously a necessary art to have if you're going to report anything, which is storytelling, to keep your reader reading. 
because none of us, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, atomic science or history or English or English literature or whatever it might be, want to sit and plow through something that just goes on and on and on without any attempt to sort of make resolution about it. So let me, was that somebody coming in? Oh, oh okay. Um, let, let, let me let, let me talk about this. This is you know I, I, again what I what I thought of as I was reading your book is uh, the notion of storytelling is Angela Lansbury and to you know to paraphrase her the story of human history involves tales as old as time uh, or in the specific case of your book the legacy of conquest at least as old as the uh, 18th and 19th centuries uh, in the con context of the American West. Uh, much of the focus uh, is on what we call the legend of the cowboy, right? I mean, it's at the heart of what's currently the number one show on television, Yellowstone, um, which attempts to transplant, in my opinion, to transplant uh, sort of traditional Western Old West conflicts into a 21st century setting, either with or without historical accuracy, but that's a story for another day. On the one hand, uh, if you're dealing with storytelling and that particular topic, of uh, cowboys and the legend of the cowboy. On the one hand, we have the image that's been honed by novel after novella going back to the dime novels of the 19th century, Owen Wister and Zane Gray and those kind of writers who first popularized uh, cowboy storytelling. And then movie after movie going all the way back to William S. Hart. On the one hand, you know, we have uh, on the uh, that particular historical development of storytelling. On the other hand, we have what, truth? Um, in The Legacy of Conquest, you, you write about environmentalist Edward Abbey and the notion of the romantic cowboy. And I have a quote here that I, that I wanna uh, put out and get your comment on. Concerning ranchers who were after all the only reason that the cowboy came into existence, you quote Edward Abbey as pointing out that, uh, quote, the ranchers replace wildlife with ugly, clumsy, stupid, bawling, stinking, fly-covered, shit-smeared, disease-spreading brutes. Contrary to popular image, the rancher, with a few honorable exceptions, is a man who strings barbed wire all over the range, drills wells, and bulldozes stock ponds, drives off natural wildlife, poisons coyotes and prairie dogs, shoots eagles, bears, and cougars on sight, supplants the native grasses with tumbleweed, poverty weed, cow shit, anthills, mud, dust, and flies, and then leans back and grins at the TV camera. That's Edward Abbey as quoted in your book. So I wanted to give you a chance to sort of elaborate on that a little bit and why you thought that was an important uh, uh, piece of uh, contemporary writing to include in your legacy of the uh, con conquest uh, story. I had no idea I quoted from Abby at such length and I owe his estate an apology, I guess. I think I was still in fair use, but I don't, and I also am not entirely sure why I thought that quotation uh, deserved that much space. So I, I believe what we have to do here is recognize that we are older than we used to be, Eric. And if we look back at the age of the person who wrote Legacy of Conquest, I was 35 when I was finishing that. I knew the people who had a, a cattle ranch on the outside of my hometown, which kind of an interesting family, but not a, well, complicated family. But I, I didn't really know many ranchers at the time I was writing Legacy of Conquest. I really, I think the people in my edge of my hometown might've been the only ranchers that I had ever dined with, at least on one occasion. So in the time since then, I have enjoyed the company of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. I have spent time with people who are uh, who know what to do with cattle in a way that I never would. A friend who is a noted paleontologist once said to me, oh, you should go to a branding sometime. Patty. You should go to the, to the where they take the calves and castrate them and brand them. He said, I mean, you should do that. And I said, I don't think I could be very good at at that he said well you should know what that's like you should have to hold down the rear end of a calf well well that's not quite where you want to be when the strain is going on well anyway so he thought i was deficient in knowing what it was like to be a rancher and he was right he was right 
And so I don't quite know why I honored Edward Abbey, who was quite a piteous performer of male toughness. I mean, one of the things, Edward Abbey had a very interesting career and he had a wonderful effect in awakening many people, the beauty of deserts and so on. But he was very locked and having, just being stuck in a classic Western guy, tough fellow operating mode. And that, that passage just reeks of him saying, I've got to figure it figured out and I know what to say about people and I don't have to worry about having to revise my ideas because my ideas are right. And so in some ways he was, in my opinion, kind of weirdly echoing the overconfident masculine figure of the cowboy, even as he was mocking that. So I'm a little bit surprised that I gave him that much airtime and that I didn't say what I know to be true, that cowboys in the 19th century, like 19th century, it's a terrible job. That it, It's an industrial workplace that's really dangerous. And, and cowboys are very subject in the late 19th century to very uh, grim injuries without any employer responsibility. A, a very strange conservative writer uh, wrote a, a book, he's Elmer Kelton, who's very much loved in Texas as a novelist, he's part of now, but he wrote a book about the day the cowboys struck. And it's, it's almost, when I finally read Elmer Kelton's book, I thought, this is an extraordinarily intense reminder that the romanticizing, the major, major injury that was done by the romanticizing was the dehumanizing of, of cowboys as working people. The, the book starts with an episode where a young cowboy has, has a fracture and employer takes no responsibility for that. He got it in the line of work. So there's much to be said about cowboys and there's much to be said about how they could claim and I would say a good share of the time are stewards of the environment. They are careful, they are thoughtful, they know the uh, world of nature in ways that people living in, in suburbs and going to office places to work are never gonna know. They should be in the conversation. So what we've had is a strange confrontation with my former self where I think, do you quote that Patty? Cause you had you bought that from that powerful figure, Edward Abbey? And what else did you buy from, from doubtful sources if you got that? I think it is really important to be in touch with all the dimensions of this. Those of us who are carnivores, where did that meat come from? What environmental prices, what prices to the, to the fellow who raised the cattle, but then had to deliver them to a feedlot and lost most of the profit from that transitional stage into the food processing world. I mean, there's all kinds of things to talk about and they're really interesting. Mel Coleman was a spectacular guy who I had not met. Coleman, natural beef, uh, a rancher from fifth or fourth or fifth generation rancher from Southern Colorado. Well, okay. So I am different than I was when I wrote Legacy, which is different from saying, now I owe the world an apology or I should write a better passage on cowboys, but I have certainly tried to see that. And what may be the most important factor is, of all is how did that image of people with really hard jobs exposed to unbearable variations in weather and storms and river crossings where a cowboy could easily drown in the, in the crossings from Texas to the North, all those things. How do we turn that into a situation where Henry Kissinger said that he and his life as an international diplomat saw himself as a cowboy riding into town? Henry Kissinger thought he was a cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, all right. That, Let's, that, hang, that's hang a on. great, that's a, that, well, hang on. I got to, I got to follow up with a comment. That's a great comeback, Patty. And no one ever would ever accuse Edward Abbey, who was very timely in the seventies and eighties of not having his own agenda to advance his storytelling. And I think your answer gives enlightenment to perhaps what Taylor uh, uh, Sheridan is up to in his Yellowstone storytelling, which is to have people develop an appreciation, not only in the, in the present time, but in the past for what the cowboy contributed to in the growth of the nation. So yeah, let's move on. I know that's- what Okay, all right, that, that's excellent. All right, here's, here's what I'm gonna do right now. We've been through three segments, we got two more to go. Um, I'm gonna score each segment. The, the first one, I would give a six. Second one, I would give a seven. This last segment, I would give a 10. That was tremendous. <laughs> that, that was really digging into the gold that we had hoped we would get to. Let's see what the future holds here. Um, section number four, we've titled Recit um, Recitation versus Interpretation. Take it away, Eric. 
Yeah, what we're talking about here is uh, what, what what is said versus what is meant. It talks it crosses a lot of uh, territory, language and and uh, body language and so forth. But there's a great story that you tell in Legacy, involving uh, the most famous of all Canadian artist explorers, Paul Kane. I don't know if you remember the story, but I think I can refresh it. In 1848, he wrote that the language of the Chinook uh, Indians, uh, I'm sorry, that's the term I learned to mass, the Chinook Indians, was so foreign to English that he found it, quote, impossible to represent by any combination of our alphabet the horrible, harsh, and spluttering sounds which proceed from their throats, end of his quote. The story you, you tell in the book is re, uh, relating uh, a phrase that the Chinook came to use when greeting white men. And the, and the phrase that appears in the book is clock ho aya, clock ho aya. Do you remember that? And if so, uh, can you tell the story of what uh, clock ho aya was derived from? Right. I think that the, the language that uh, Kane was hearing was sort of one of those patois things where a, uh, a jargon that it follows from different languages, Indian languages, but also French and English and so on. So, so it got really all hybridized. I would have to use an academic word. They're all mixed up is another way of putting it. So it turns out that there had been a trader who these folks had encountered whose name was Clark. And he often said in the manner of our people down to this day, as a white guy, he would say, how are you? And so Clack Hawaii was pretty easily decoded and deciphered as a set of syllables and sounds that were introduced by the encounters and interactions between Indian people and white people. And this traditional greeting, Clack Hawaii, really was, uh, why not let it be a traditional greeting? Because it was a way in which strangers had picked up things from each other. And that is part of American Indian tradition, not to, not to stay the same for centuries and then have some sudden forced changes, but to always be adapting and bringing in new ideas and uh, seeing what might work from other people's holdings of language and so on. So Clack Hawaii was one way I was trying to say, don't go for this notion of changeless Indian people frozen in a distant past. They're, they're dynamic long before white people hit the continent. They're trading the trade routes in North America, which I may or may not know much about when I was writing Legacy, but man, shells from the Pacific end up all over, all over the interior West. So it's just a way, my little way of saying, people are seeming to meet each other and are uh, going into the stereotype with Indian people that they have been changeless and these are ancient traditions that they have always followed. And many of them are, but other parts are just Oh, we ran into this guy and this is what he said to us. Okay. Can I ask a, just a clarifying question there? So um, are you saying that Indian cultures tend to be more uh, willing to change and less rigid, rigid and stuck in age old traditions than, than lots of other cultures? Uh, since I'm speaking to a scientist, I'm going to say I would need some help in calibrating that <laughs> or, uh, and who is less. I think that I will say uh, Indian people do have and did have adaptability down because they needed that often. Um, the bison weren't going to show up wherever Indian people wanted them to be and await the arrival of the hunters. So adaptability was a huge part of staying alive and bringing in resources and keeping families fed and so on. So. And also a lot of uh, unexpected interactions and people showing up in each other's territory and negotiating to figure out what kind of terms of peace or hostility might prevail. So Indian people certainly had that. And Randy, I guess I'm willing to say, it's not clear to me that all white Americans have had the same inducement of the quality and characteristics of their lives to be that adaptable. That especially over time, white people in North America, this what a great overgeneralization, good Lord, uh, have worked pretty hard to insulate themselves from the changeability that was just, that's how we live in North America, uh, understanding of, of Indian people. So then I wanna say what many historians have said much more clearly than I could ever have said in the eighties, it took a while for white people to figure out that they were gonna win uh, and impose their, their 
governmental structures and their ideas of what right behavior was. So in much of the 19th century, uh, white Americans, maybe especially in the relationship with Indian people through maybe into the 1870s and 1880s, felt like they were very vulnerable and didn't have the, they certainly, any, any uh, military conflict with Indians, Indian people knew the terrain. They knew where to find food. They knew where to hide. They knew who was the enemy and who wasn't. They knew all kinds of things that the clumsy, really clumsy, clumsy, clumsy white officers of military groups, they didn't know. So there's a long phase where I think white Americans on the edges of white settlement really knew it was precarious, really knew that they were in a precarious situation. Did that make them more flexible or did that make them more rigid once they started to think, oh, we can we can prevail here? So, so that's a great uh, thing. I, I think there are very good reasons to say that Indian people had stronger, it's ironic, uh, a little bit stronger traditions of adaptability. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's, that's I was I, I was drawn to the uh, I was drawn uh, just one more quick thing on that I was drawn to the uh, language aspect of what you were of, of what that story focuses on which is the attempt on the part of one group to try and assimilate the language of the other group or to interpret whatever the sounds were that they were equally perplexed about. And it reminded me of a scene in the uh, 1964 movie uh, Mutiny on the Bounty. <laughs> that's uh, that's got uh, a Fletcher Christian uh, Mar- played by Marlon Brando meeting his Tahitian love, and they they fall uh, into a, a, a collection of uh, fern bushes to try to get to know each other before moving forward in their relationship. And he's doing the classic thing, trying to tell her his name. He's pointing to himself and she, pointing to her and trying to say, that's the beginning of any communication dynamic is, uh, who are you and who am I? And he says, points to himself and says, Fletcher. And she uh, she says something that doesn't sound like Fletcher. And he says, no, no, Fletcher. And she says, no, no, Fletcher. And then she starts to call him, no, no, Fletcher. And, uh, you know, again, words have meanings whether you intended them or not. When a historian goes to uh, source materials to draw facts, uh, how important is the process of developing and communicating accurate meanings of words and expressions that is to decipher what is said versus what was uh, uh, interpreted? Uh, I'm happy to say that, uh, two things, I'm happy to say that the author of Legacy of Conquest really hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about that. But pretty soon after that, me, the author of Legacy of Conquest, became really preoccupied with the role of translators and interpreters in Western American history. And after being oblivious, as indeed many historians, I guess, still are, to the fact that when you have like a treaty negotiation and there are Indians and some white officials there, the most important person there is the interpreter or translator who is taking the words of the Indian people and transmitting them to the white people and taking English and transmitting it to the People. So we didn't study, my people did not study those folks, even though they were the most consequential. My simple-minded summary would be that when the interpreter performed well, fewer people got killed or injured. Well, okay, so we didn't study them because you cannot go to an archive. There's no archive, but you can go in and say, please give me your boxes and folders on interpreters because these were not people, people who were in that position were not people who wrote autobiographies, who wrote letters to their families back East. So these were mostly people from very humble circumstances, often mixed white Indian ancestry, and oftentimes really kind of purposely trying to keep a low profile. They did not want to be the center of the intention. They were in a vulnerable enough situation as it was. So this, I'm now proud to say I have 10 young historians who are working with me on a collection of essays original essays on interpreters and translators in the American West and Northern Mexico. So we finally got around. I tried for years to persuade young people to this, but we finally had that we'd better pay attention to those words and we better pay attention to what an amazing cognitive puzzle it was to take two very disparate languages, a native language and an English language and to translate the words, but also the context and meaning of those words. And the people working on these essays, there's just plenty of stuff about how Indian people are just charging on all 
cylinders, not syllables, <laughs> almost a pun there. Anyway, they're charging on all cylinders, just trying to say, how do I take this communication and turn it into something the other side will understand and not misunderstand in a way that could be dangerous for everyone? So I'm, I'm proud to be part is the old person encouraging the young people, but they are doing a really great project on that. And yes, we have to be very careful to think, here is a word, sometimes it's a word in English, we think, oh, we know that word, but we don't. And we really need to think about what did that word mean at the particular time in which it appears in the historical record. And that's often a real- that's, that's exactly what I was looking for. And that's a great explanation. And let me bring, let me bring this to a close here because uh, you know we pretty much all the stuff is interwoven and you've done a great job of handling what I thought were the indiv individual themes. The, the last theme that we identified and it, it moves pretty quickly here is uh, the notion of uh, writing the book now in 2023 as opposed to when you wrote it in 1987 or 86. And two preeminent themes that struck me as I read a, a Legacy of Contrast were the notions of virtue and victimization, virtue versus victimization. The first, uh, the first really detailed uh, book that I ever read uh, that struck me emotionally, at least, about the Old West was Barry My Heart at Wounded Knee uh, by Dee Brown, written in 1970. And then 50 years later, there was another book written uh, called The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. And obviously, both of those uh, books and both of those accounts deal with the incident at Wounded Knee, which is the heart of which is victimization and virtue, and how the two of them tried to, to coexist. When I was uh, doing some research about the latest book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, I came across this quote, and this is a prelude to my last question. It's from the New York Times, a review that was written in the New York Times about The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. Uh, and the quote is as follows, white Americans have long defined the past through narratives of frontier freedoms. Recently, however, historians have moved away from such self-justifying accounts and a growing field has made the experiences of indigenous displacement, survival, and resurgence a new pathway for the understanding of the nation's history. Uh, did that quote make sense to you? And here's my question. Uh, if you sat down today in 2023 in the middle of everything that's going on in our nation and around the world, culturally and otherwise, and you were going to write the legacy of conquest, how would the written historical message be shaped by the collective voices of what that, that uh, review refers to as the indigenous displacement, survival, and resurgence of the Native peoples? Well, I am so lucky not to have that assignment in real life because uh, there's so much dynamic research of young folks asking questions that would never have occurred to me and, and that I still would struggle to put into a, oh, heaven's sake, if I had to do that, the thing where you'd have to have a wheelbarrow to carry my book, if I tried to bring all the stuff that young folks have figured out, researched and understood. I'm reading right now a, a dissertation it's been reading a dissertation about air and how uh, Western air differs from air because of elevation, because of sunlight, because of aridity, how air is a different resource in the American West than it is, and, it's, and it is a resource. Um, and that author, a uh, great young historian, has been careful to keep returning to Indian people's experiences with air and environmental regulation. The punchline of all this is that this author has revealed what I never would have thought of, never really put together in the least, but environmental laws of the 1960s and 1970s, a number of tribes thought we could use that. And so in ways that the uh, folks in Washington DC passing those laws never necessarily thought about, those laws in the hands of Indian people became ways of asserting a greater sovereignty. And that has led them uh, to see their airshed as not just the boundaries of their land, but beyond that. So I never, until a week ago, I never realized that had been going on. So anyway, so it's, but we cannot allow that to push or I don't know what, nudge uh, the history of Mexican Americans, the history of Asian Americans, the history of African Americans, the history of all the different classes of white people. So putting all that together Thank the heavens is not my obligation. And it seems like it might be straining the seams of the field 
called Western American History. Various things have been making me just over the last few weeks of thinking I had it easy. I had a moment. Oh, thank you, mother and father, for that birthday, being born in 1951. Yay! Thank you so much, mother and father, because that brought me out of graduate school and into the world of Western history when it was really viable. It was imaginable to say, I'm going to read as much as I can and read it carefully. And then it, it's all fragments. It's all pieces and parts and they're scattered and they're disparate and they're not brought together. I'm going to read as much as I can. I'm going to try to put it together. Uh, that was so easy because of my mother and father thinking ahead and having me born in 1951. That made it all possible. For anybody today, and my understanding is that it's actually posing a problem that to say, uh, are you a Western American historian? That can send some people off into a very long journey of trying to say, oh, it depends on what you really mean by the West. And uh, I'm a historian of the, of the Chicano movement in Denver, but does that make me a West? I mean, it's gotten, I would have had no trouble and was very happy saying, you bet the Chicano movement in Denver, that's part of Western history, front and center. But it's, well, it's true of so many dimensions of our life now. It's very hard to put the pieces together. And I feel really, really uh, great sympathy for the people who might be trying to do that now. So yes, David Troyer is somebody I like and admire. I think I did a blurb for that, that book. I'm really glad he did that. And it's a, a, a Ned Blackhawk's new book in the same way, wonderful big picture with details and compelling stories uh, telling of, the, of, West, of Indian history, American Indian history. How you bring that in relationship, well, to African-American history, there's a lot of that going on, that there are uh, black soldiers, sometimes used to be called Buffalo soldiers. There are places where, where uh, in, in Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma, where black people had come as the slaves, as you pointed out, of the, of the five civilized tribes, and who then tried to assert land claims or to become tribal members. So you can't separate black history from Indian history. You certainly can't separate uh, Mexican American history from Indian history because of the mixed race mestizo thing. So, well, and let let me um now pull this all together because you've just graded right into pure ABT material there, which is exactly what we're dealing with these days. Um, we're working with the World Bank, and we talk with them, and and we talk about the singular narrative that's so crucial to be able to communicate effectively. And they say, yeah, but in this country, we've got 18 different projects and we want to talk about all 18 at once. And we try and explain if you try and tell about everything at once, you end up telling about nothing at all. People just don't pick up anything. Um, and that's very interesting that you're saying that is really kind of what you're seeing of today's times is that ten everybody wanting to fractionate everything as smallest to be, make everything accurate by bringing it down to those fine details and ending up just with a, everything clogged up where you can't really make any clear patterns. Um, so this we, we got to wrap this up um, because maybe this is only episode one of, of maybe we'll do this again because there's so much more we could have gotten into. By the way, I am the world's worst introducer of characters. And I think I failed to point out that I brought a ringer here because what I didn't mention is that Eric had spent, I think, about what was it, 14 years in Alaska working a lot with Native American tribes wow. up there. Um, can you tell us two or three sentences on that, Eric, that I should have said up front? Hmm uh yeah i spent 14 years working with uh, 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 uh working among other things uh, with a large portion of my legal time spent uh, dealing with uh, the uh, villagers on the on the northwest coast and in the southeastern region of alaska uh, uh dealing with issues like the navigable waterway uh, act and um and the offshore fishery so uh so yeah that was that was very uh, helpful to me and it spiked my interest even more than it was already spiked uh in that period of history so i, I think that explains a bit why he got so deep into your book and it connected with so much um and that's why there's so much more that we could talk about but for today that is a lot and uh yeah that was really great you know i think it it, it took a few minutes there to get up to speed but once we got into that middle segment on storytelling uh there was a lot of great stuff in there i'm, I'm gonna look forward to listening to all this uh once matt gets it all put together and listen to it again so okay uh thanks very much brother eric maybe we'll do this again sometime soon uh but more importantly thank you patty greatly appreciated and uh let's do some more abt work in the near future and amazing all the different projects you're you're constantly working on and as you said that whole it's great we got in that last segment that you were able to talk about doing the interpreters with 10 yeah. uh, historians that's tremendous so um 
Cool. Thanks very much. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. And see everybody next time here on the ABT Time podcast. Hasta luego. Bye bye. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Eric. Bye bye. <laughs>